So I was always in leadership roles at quite young ages. And then when I was 20 years old, I had 12 full-time employees already. To build an amazing business, it has to be a little bit more than a business and a little bit less than a religion. It has to be in that zone of a cult. We took the company from 14 employees to 3,100 employees in six years, went from 2 million in revenue to 106 million in revenue. The only entrepreneurs that I've met that don't invest or don't want to invest in their people are the ones that are very short-sighted or they don't see that this is the solution to their problems. Hey, Cameron, welcome to the show. Hey, Steve, good to see you again. Now, if someone's been living under a rock or on some kind of like a, a stellar galactic you know, planet or something and doesn't know who Cameron Howard is, then wow, they're in for a surprise. Um, <laughs> how many books in total have you written? I've written six now, and I had six. no desire to ever be an author in the first place. So the <laughs> fact that I wrote one is incredible, but uh, I've written six. Well, I'm glad you went against it because I, I love free PR. Uh, I love the vivid vision, double, double. I know you've got another book second in command out. So I'm glad you went against it and got over your uh, your situation in, in, in writing books. But I'd like to start right at the beginning. You are, and I would say, and there's few people that I will title this, a natural born leader and educator. When did you first realize that you had a way with this beautiful smoothness that you have to get people to be better by, by doing things maybe a little bit differently? Wow. It's interesting. If I, if I go back to even in my time in grade school, I was always leading others. Um, I was, you know, the, the top cub. I was the top scout. I was the, the head altar boy. I was always, I was coaching youth skiing, so I was always in leadership roles at quite young ages. And then when I was 20 years old, I had 12 full-time employees already. So at, at a young age, I was already, you know, growing people and leading people. And, uh, and I, I did it in a way that I was never better than them. So I, I more like tried to build a culture and build a movement. Um, you know, I didn't grow up in that era of the do it my way and it's my damn company. I, it was more, how do we move everybody together as a team? So I think it was probably that, just that, that very young age being involved in doing it. And then even people have asked, like, when did I start speaking? I mean, we've all started speaking when we were about, you know, a year and a half old, right? Uh, but I started doing speaking competitions when I was in grade two. So I've been wow. standing on stages doing speaking contests for my whole life. So it's always just been a natural thing for me. Now, I know I, there's a lot a lot to cover here, and you very, very graciously spent time with us in our Speakeasy crew. You recently spoke with the community in the Sims Distillery community, and a lot of the time when I hear you speak, whatever the topic is, and there's a wide range of topics that you can cover, and we're going to grab a couple of those. It's usually seen a common thread, and you've already used the word once, culture. Culture is very, very important to you, and to those you align yourself with, why is culture so important, and especially today? Um, well, there's two two threads actually. One is culture. I think the second is that I dumb down everything that I teach, and it's because I was never the smart kid in school. I, I really struggled with high school, struggled with university, got out with a two point three two point four GPA. So I was never able to understand the complex, but I was able to take the complex and then synthesize it into a post-it note and, and kind of simplify everything. So whenever I teach content, whether it's in my books or speaking events or, you know, speaking to groups over Zoom, I tend to speak in sound bites. I tend to give the short, easy to implement tactical solutions. I, I tend to stay away from the kind of theoretical because I just don't know how to talk that way or think that way. Culture for me has always been a way to get more done with less people faster, right? If you get a, a group of people that are highly aligned, highly excited, all working together towards a common goal, all believe in the same thing, that kind of culture tends to get more done. So for me, it was just, it was easier than, um, than driving or pushing people. And then I had a, a very early stage mentor, Greg Clark, who was building a, a group called College Pro Painters. And I remember him back in 1986 saying that to build an amazing business, it has to be a little bit more than a business and a little bit less than a religion. It has to be in that zone of a cult. And that really 
stuck with me that um, culture was critical. So that's kind of a, a 35-year-old lesson that's always stood with me. Hey, I'm sorry for interrupting this podcast. I know it's a brilliant one. But I wanted to talk to you about your room, your connections. Now, we know full well that great things come from great connections and great rooms. Now, if you're in a room full of people that will challenge you, inspire you, motivate you, and support you, then great. But if not, then maybe I have the solution for you. Head on over to stevedsims.com, look up Sims Distillery there, and join our community of creative disruptors, those that are only not there to help you and motivate and actually give you information, but to support and answer questions. We very much vet the room to make sure that we support each other's growth. We all want each other to grow. So if you want to be in the right room, head on over to stevedsims.com slash Sims Distillery, and I'll see you inside my room. Enjoy the rest of the show. I, I urge anyone to look up any of the speeches that Cameron's done, and especially when he actually talks about that and goes into recruiting on culture, not onto resumes. Um, you've had a great career, and I'm, I'm not saying it's over, but you were very dominant in getting 1-800-GET-JUNK where it was. Where did that come about? What role did you play in that? Yeah, so my my best friend, Brian, um, we were in an entrepreneur mastermind. I've always invested in myself. I've always joined mastermind communities and had coaches and, you know, shown up in, in rooms where I can learn from others. So we had joined an organization back in the mid-90s called the Young Entrepreneurs Organization. It was called the YEO. It's now called EO. They dropped the Y and it's now called the Entrepreneurs Organization. And we were in a forum together. So we actually met every single month for four and a half years. And he watched me build two other companies And I watched him building what was called the Rubbish Boys. And then behind the scenes over drinks and on our morning runs, I would be coaching him and teaching him how to grow his business. And when I exited the private currency company that I was president of and was looking for my next gig, he asked me if I would coach him. And I said, I'd coach him. I would never work for him. I said, working for you would be like kissing my sister. Well, (laughs) six and a half years later, it was like, (laughs) you know, we'd had this business love affair because I was there the whole time. So I joined him as employee number 14. And I understood how to scale a franchise organization and how to grow a fast growing company because I'd already done it three times. So Brian was able to really delegate everything to me. He ran IT and finance. I ran everything else. So I ran operations, PR, marketing, the call center. At one point, I ran sales franchise or franchise sales, all of our corporate operations and culture really all reported into me. So it was by me understanding how to scale companies and do that. We took the company from 14 employees to 3,100 employees in six years, went from 2 million in revenue to 106 million in revenue. Um, I left there 16 years ago, and I've been doing it ever since, working behind the scenes, coaching high growth companies, and then building out something called the COO Alliance ever since. Now, we're going to go into the COO and the second in command, but probably one of the most powerful books, and as I say, I've read many of your books, but one of the most powerful and the one that recently my son got hooked onto that we actually had you speak on my community for was Vivid Vision. Now, a lot of people out there have heard of the book Vivid Vision. A lot of people out there dangerously think they know what it stands for but get it wrong. Right. Um, and that that I'm surprised for. But when did you discover what a Vivid Vision was and when did you decide to put that into the, into the, the boundaries of a book? Yeah, so Vivid Vision, uh, the book on Amazon has got well over a thousand five star reviews now. So it's doing really, really well globally. Back in 1998, so 35 years ago, no, 25 years ago, thank God, um, Brian and I were both invited to a lunch with the Entrepreneurs Organization. And it was a Canadian Olympic coach who was going to speak about how athletes use visualization and how we could take a visualization concept and bring it into our companies. So at the time, I was building a private currency business. Brian was building the Rubbish Boys. Uh, Someone else in our forum went to that lunch. He was building like an engineering company. And we all created these visions for our company based on this kind of methodology. Brian called his a painted picture. Mine was just called a vivid vision. And, And we rolled these out to our businesses. And that's how we decided or got them aligned in where we were going. When I left that private currency company two years later, Brian showed me his vivid vision for 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Again, he called it a painted picture. But him showing me that three-year vision of what his company looked like, act like, and felt like three years in the future, 
I was able to understand instantly what he wanted to build. I could see exactly what I could contribute. I could see all the sentences I could make come true. And I was able to put the plan in place very quickly and he could kind of sign off on the plan and say, yeah, this looks amazing. So that's where we learned it was that an Olympic coach speaking to this mastermind community that we'd invested in being a part of. And the book has taken off. The book has actually, mm-hmm. you know, grown its own feet. It's run out there. Quite simply, I would say there was a cult following uh, around Vivid Vision. I remember standing in um, a Speakeasy Hollywood and I had – Kasim Aslam, who's like the, the number one expert for Google, Brandon Turner from Bigger Pockets, and Brandon Turner talking to Kasim about Vivid Vision was and changed his life. And if it hadn't yeah. been for Vivid Vision, he wouldn't be there. So great, great advocate of the book. But how does it feel to be getting those kind of accolades and reviews from the book? It's, it's funny. Kasim was a, a recent speaker at our COO Alliance. And the way that I met Brandon Turner from Bigger Pockets was a former CEO that I used to coach said that he heard Brandon talking about the Vivid Vision concept on his podcast. So I just reached out to say, hey, thanks for mentioning it. Who are you? I had no idea how big the show was or who this guy yeah. was. Um, and he's been talking about it ever since. It was great. I actually first wrote about the Vivid Vision concept in my first book, Double Double. Um, It was just a single chapter, though, in my book, Double Double. I also did a single chapter in my book, The Miracle Morning for Entrepreneurs, that I co-authored with Hal Elrod, who you know. Um, But it never did it enough justice. There wasn't enough there in the single chapter. It was a good enough glimpse to get people excited and get them doing it, but it needed more in terms of how to write it, how to roll it out internally, how do you reverse engineer the vivid vision And then also, how can you create one for your personal life? How could you create one for your marriage? Right? How can you really take that vivid vision and take it to the next level? Now, I don't want to wait until the end to tell people how to follow you and how they can get the book. So tell us Mm -hmm. now, what's the best place for people to follow you? And what's the best place to actually go if they want to find out about the books before we get into the next section of this podcast? Sure. Go to CameronHerald.com. It's H-E-R-O-L-D. So CameronHerald.com. And that has links to all my social media, my YouTube channels, the course, everything that I've covered is all off of that uh, Cameron Herald page. And then all of my books are available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes. And then for sure, they definitely want to check out the Second Command podcast that we have as well. Perfect. I want to get into that because it's something that all entrepreneurs you know, we fail at, you know, we all suddenly get the God complex because whatever we're working on suddenly becomes successful and we end up working on the business. And as you said, quite openly, you're very used to investing in yourself, but we quite often overlook the one that's just one step beneath us, which is usually the person that we pile all the shit on and then yell at when it all goes wrong. So why did, well, not why, when did you realize that that second in command, that COO, was actually the one that needed the most attention. Well, and it was the COO, and it was also the whole management and leadership team. So in building all of the companies that I built, I was very heavily engaged in coaching leaders. I learned coaching back at College Pro Painters. In fact, by 1993, I'd already coached 120 entrepreneurs. So 30 years ago, before coaching was even a thing, I'd already coached 120 entrepreneurs. So I brought coaching into the business world quite early in the companies that I was building where I would coach and train and certify managers on these different competencies that they needed to be successful in their roles. And that became the core content for my Invest in Your Leaders course. Then while I was also the second command for Brian at 1-800-GOT-JUNK, I was then growing in my own ways as a COO. Brian was joint, was still a member of the Entrepreneurs Organization because I was his second in command. I no longer qualified. So I got into strategic coach. I began attending other mastermind groups. I started devouring online content to learn and to grow my skills and kept working on training and growing the management team. And the only way that we were able to scale the company so quickly was by growing our people because effectively, we doubled the size of the company every year for six years. And in my, in my mindset, that meant I had to grow the skills of my people as fast as I was growing the company. If I was doubling the company, they had to have double the skills. Otherwise, they were going to be out of a job. So it just became a mindset and a real focus for me, not only to grow myself as the COO, but I needed to really replicate myself quickly. Otherwise, my whole team would be out of a job. It wasn't okay 
for just the CEO to grow. It wasn't okay for just the COO to grow. We had to grow all the operations people and all the managers and leaders. Do you get much resistance from that? Because a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs, they like to hold on to all of the gold mm. and you know to, to to feed what they feel is necessary to those beneath. It's a bad way of doing it. I know I've been responsible until you suddenly realize that hey, your team is what makes the company great, not you. But how do you get over that resistance and reluctance? It's funny. This is going back again, back to College Pro Painters, which I rarely speak about as often as I am today. But at College Pro Painters, I learned this concept called personal selling, which is all about understanding the individual's needs and selling whatever you have as the solution to get them to their needs. Well, every entrepreneur that I've ever met is running the company for only three reasons, to give them more money, to give them more free time, or to be able to put a flag or a stake in the ground to say they accomplished something. So what I try to do is to show the leader the reason you're growing your people is to have a better business, a bigger business, a faster growing company, more profit for you. So I can show you the return on investment and the return on time of growing people I just appeal to their sense of greed or need or you know desire to build something better. So in the case of 1-800-GOT-JUNK, we wanted to build a globally admired brand. The only way to be able to do that was to have people that could build a globally admired brand, which meant give them the skills. And if you can put in place systems like the Invest in Your Leaders course, it can be done in such a cost advantageous way that it's almost irresponsible to not put your people through the content. So it doesn't become a big sales pitch at all to walk an entrepreneur through. The only entrepreneurs that I've met that don't invest or don't want to invest in their people are the ones that are very short-sighted or they don't see that this is the solution to their problems. And do you get over that or do you just realize that early and leave them on and walk on? I'll just worry about the ones who are engaged in it. You know, years ago, I was coaching a company. I coached them for four years from about 40 employees up to 600 employees. The company is called Blue Grace Logistics. And I taught the CEO one of the modules in my Invest in Your Leaders course. It was the module on email management. Still extremely relevant today on how to manage a ton of emails and communication. And Bobby, the CEO, said, wow, this is amazing. Like, this skill will change the business. And I said, no, it won't. It'll change your productivity. But what will change the business is teaching this skill to all of your managers and anyone who manages people in your company. That will drastically change the company. So we did. We just trained everybody in the company on Inbox Zero, and that drastically changed the organization. So it's when you realize that, yeah, for a CEO to be in the Genius Network or to be in YPO or to be in, you know, Steve's distillery, that's great. But that doesn't entirely change the company. Get your COO into the CO Alliance. Get your operations people into the ops spot. Put your any of your managers through the course on investing your leaders. Like invest about one or two percent of that person's salary every year on growing their skills and your company goes to the moon. Is that why there's another book? Uh, No, the book, The Second in Command, (sighs) why the hell did I write book number six? Um, (laughs) I started the CEO Alliance six years ago and I recognized that I had a lot of IP on the CEO, COO relationship that I'd never talked about. And I had started the Second in Command podcast, and I'd interviewed about 300 guests at the time. I've now had 330 guests on the podcast. And again, we never interviewed the CEO. We only interviewed their COO. So again, I had a lot of IP from them, and there was nowhere that it was being shared. It wasn't in any of my other five books. I wasn't even doing speaking events on the content. Very, very, very rarely was I ever asked to speak about it. Once at War Room, and I think once at, a, at an MMT event, was I ever even doing roundtables on the COO? So I just decided to codify it and put it out there because there really wasn't any good information. And the book's blown up. We've got over 250 five-star reviews. And the book's only been out for about six months. And so you you, you put the bike book together. You had this IP. What has it done for you? Has it brought a little bit more attention to the fact that people have to do it? Because I know you have courses, but people need to understand that who they're with, and like every entrepreneur, who you are with is the sum of you. They need to realize they need to pay attention to them. Is the book out helping that? One thing that the, that the book, The Second in Command, has done is it's shown entrepreneurs that they are very different than their COO counterpart. Very similar to men and women in a traditional marriage, we're not hairy versions of women. We see the world differently. We think differently. We perceive differently. We we just see the. It's kind of like the book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. So there's a, a great amount of content in the book, The Second in Command, 
written for both the CEO and their second in command to understand how to communicate together, how to collaborate, how to solve problems, how to help shine the spotlight on each other. So I think it's it's done a good, uh, a really good job at helping those groups out. We've certainly gained a ton of members because of it already. Um, and it's also really driving the the listeners on our second in command podcast. We're now getting 100,000 listeners monthly just for the podcast. So it's really starting to blow up that exposure. And when you say getting in a group, is that the uh, COO Alliance? It is, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a, I don't know how many groups there are for entrepreneurs. We've got YPO, EO, Vistage, Genius Network, you know, your distillery. We've got Mastermind Talks and there's Maverick. <laughs> there's tons, right? Yeah. But the, and then there were groups for lawyers and engineers and but there was and the marketers, but there was never anything for that second in command. The closest we ever had, Vistage created something called the Key Executive Forum, and that was for key execs. But you'd have a head of finance with a marketing manager and a COO. The only similarity is they manage people. We really needed an organization that was specifically for that second in command, and that was why we started the CO Alliance six years ago. What if, if someone gets involved in it, what should they expect? Because they're, for a start, they're not getting involved into it. That second in command is invo- getting involved in it. In correct. It, correct? Yeah, we've I, got about, I would say about 50% of our members are COOs who want to join and they go and tell their CEO about it. And the CEO says, yes, do it. And the other half are CEOs who say, I want something like this for my second in command. And they know me and they trust me. So they say, get my COO to join. So we've got both of those groups. What they get from it is a community of like-minded individuals who are growing themselves and growing the company. They have a community that meets online every month for two hours to connect with each other with speakers and breakouts and group discussions. They have the closed private Slack community where they can engage with each other and ask questions and share resources 24-7 throughout the month. And then we have two in-person events a year, one that's held at MIT in Boston, and one that's either held in Vancouver or Scottsdale. We rotate back and forth between those. Now, I think it was Richard Branson that turned around and said, um, love and educate your staff so much that they can leave, but they won't want to. I can't help thinking with you paying that much kind of attention to your COO, your second in command, your team, by putting them into a group with you that – They get all this education that's only going to increase their loyalty. Surely that's got to be a byproduct. Massively increase their loyalty. I also heard a saying recently, and it was that, you know, what if I invest in my people, like I put them into the Invest in Your Leaders course, or I I put them into the COO Alliance and they leave. And I said, well, what if you don't invest in their growth and they stay? (laughs) Like, like you have all these people that don't know how to do their job. You know, I'll give you an example of this. So, Think about the people that work for you and even for yourself. How much training have you had on doing interviews, like on actually interviewing and hiring Mm. people? How much training have you had? Yeah, very, very little, only experience, correct. Right, and and maybe you've been doing it wrong all of this time, right? Yeah, yes. How much training have you had on running meetings? How much training have you had on running one-on-one meetings, on coaching, on delegation, on time management, project management, handling conflict? There's all of these executive functioning skills that most managers have had no training in whatsoever. So at best, it's the blind leading the blind. And that's, from my viewpoint, that's why so many entrepreneurs say business is difficult. It's because you're making it difficult. You know, if we were going to send our kid off to play Little League Baseball, we would never send them off to play without teaching them how to hold the bat or catch the ball or toss the ball. Mm. Otherwise, Johnny would go off to baseball. He'd come home the first night. He'd go, Daddy, baseball sucks. Like, no, Johnny, you suck at baseball. And yet here we are running our companies thinking business is difficult. We're making it difficult because we don't give people the basic skills to actually run the business. The book. The book's out there. Again, they can find that at Cameron Howard, correct? Yeah, and on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes as well. The, the usual suspect. Did you do an audio version of it at all? I did. Two and a half days in studio in Dubai. Yeah, that's horrible. <laughs> uh, did you enjoy doing that? No, I hated it. I've never <laughs> met anyone that's done an audio book. I did, I did, I've done both of my books audio this time just to get me out of the box. I actually did the audio version in a TV studio and got it videoed, and then they scraped the audio. Yeah. Um, I ended up with a big pile of videos, which I obviously got up on gopherstupid.com for free. But 
I've never heard anybody go, oh, doing an audio book was, was fine. It was pleasant. It wasn't. And have you done, have you done six? Have you done every book on an audio? No, I, that's the only book that I did the audio for. The others I paid someone to do the audio for. And now that I have the audio recording for the second in command and so many of my videos um, of me doing speaking events, we're uploading them to 11.ai and we're going to train AI in my voice. Then we're going to upload the transcripts from each of my books and have uh, 11 do the audio recording and we're going to see how it sounds. And wow. we're pretty sure that if not this year, certainly in about six months to 12 months, AI will be able to do a full audio recording within a half hour, much faster than I could ever do it. Is that is that 11, 11labs.com? It is, yeah. Yeah, I've met you, 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 mutual friend of ours, Roland Frazier, um, super smart guy. He got with Ryan Dice and they had a tiny short argument on something <laughs> that I they recorded. It. Have you, have you heard this? Them. And it wasn't them. It was the AI that, versions of them arguing with each other. It was brilliant. That's right. He put it in a chat GPT. Give me, give me an argument between these two people. And then they uploaded their voices and they did an entire podcast that they did no recording for. And that is scary that you're going to be able to actually do your voice and actually get your audio book up there. And it's not going to be you reading it. Well, there's another thing you can do now as well, which is really cool. So um, you can actually sit and read and and then you can use an AI tool to move your eyes. So your eyes are actually looking at the audience, even though you're reading off of a teleprompter or a book that now exists as well. So I could be sitting looking to the left and looking at my notes and there's an AI tool that will adjust my eyes so that I'm looking perfectly at you, which is really creepy. But yeah, these tools exist. I'm going to yeah. give you my... My big thought on AI has been that the only employee that should be nervous about losing their job to AI are the employees that are not engaged in learning AI and learning how to leverage it day to day, right? Those employees are at risk of losing their job, but otherwise there's so many great tools out there that we just need to get exposed to and play with them. And we need to give our employees time day to day and week to week to play with these tools and then report back on what they're using them for and how they're engaged with them. Because I think that's the real power that we'll get I from it. I saw a skit a while ago. It was kind of a comedy skit, but it rung home. And it was the newspapers going on about this new technology called radio and how it was going to end the world and all t uh, all publications would be out. And then it fast-forwarded to the internet and to email. And the phone, Graham Bell, this phone. The bottom line of it is we're in a constant period of change. And, of course, we change a lot faster now as technology comes across. But it's no different now. It's a tool. And those that don't use it will, will get pushed to the side. Those that use yeah. it, they'll move on to the next thing. Exactly. If you were if you were an employee, if you were a manager or, or an employee in a company or a COO or a CEO who said, I'm never going to use a cell phone and I'm never going to use the Internet, <laughs> you're not going to be employed. Like you're just no. not going to be employed. So yeah, that, that's exactly my feeling as well. So based on that, let's start giving our employees time every week, give them one or two hours every week, have them go and check out the dashboard called there is an AI for that. And there is an AI for that has about 8,000 different AI tools that exist today to do about 10,000 different AI tasks. Chat GPT is only one of about 8,000 tools that exist. A lot of them are built off the open.ai platform, but let your employees play with the tools. And then on Monday, do a five minute book report of what they've used AI for, how they've used it in the day to day. So they can share that with the team and share that in your Slack, do screen shares or screen grabs of that. It's a really powerful way to fast forward your company. Now you run a course. Um, give us a little bit of information on the course that you actually run for people or the CEOs. Yeah. So, well, so the, I have a course that's called Invest in Your Leaders, and it's actually not just for COOs. It's for CEOs, for COOs, for anybody really who Good. manages people. And it's the 12 core skills that anyone who manages people needs to be good at. So again, it's like delegation, time management, managing projects, one-on-one -on -one meetings, interviews, managing emails, managing conflicts. It's the 12 core executive functioning skills. These are skills that I've taught people in for the last 30 years that cannot be automated. These are the soft skills that you have to be very good at to actually scale. And yes, every COO needs to be great at these skills, but they're really there for anybody who's managing people as well to be more effective. It's how to get more done with less people faster. 
Yeah, you mentioned that at the beginning, and let's be serious, that's what we want, isn't it? You know, we, yeah. we want to make sure that we maximise the, the the people to get the most out of them. I remember in the old days, you know, you were successful if you could boast about how many people you had working for you, yet we know full well that 80% of those people weren't doing much. So right. you want to get more done with less people. Where can they find out about this course? Yeah, it's called investinyourleaders.com. And uh, it's $750 per person, they get lifetime access, it's me teaching all of the 12 modules, each module has a pretest that they'll fail, they're going to realize they don't know this content, they'll go through the videos of me teaching, there's some written information, and then there's a post test that if they go through the video and, and uh, written, they'll pass all the tests. At the end of the 12 modules, they get a LinkedIn certification badge showing that they're certified in these skills. Um, and it only takes about six hours, five and a half, six hours total to go through all 12 modules. So it's a huge amount of content that comes at them very quickly that I teach all of it. We're going to put the, uh, the links in the base of this so that people can find out about it and can like, go and search. Well, I, I urge everyone to just follow this guy. I love the way, and you mentioned it quite openly, the way you dumb down the information you give and the education. It's very easy for you to be at a level where we can't understand, but you've always been able to simplify it. And I've always respected that with you. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. N number one, in building a franchise company, you have to create systems that can be used by the worst franchisee in the worst market with the worst employees and still deliver on your kind of core values and quality focus areas, right? Like McDonald's, has to be able to deliver a Big Mac at their worst location by the worst pimply faced employee in the middle of February. And, and the customers still have to go, okay, it tastes like a Big Mac. Yeah. So you have to dumb down the systems to be able to do that. So I think that way. And then secondly, because we've landed so much press over the years, you know, I wrote a book called Free PR that you've mentioned. Mm. At 1-800-GOT-JUNK, we landed 5,200 individual unique stories about our company in six and a half years. So we had a lot of experience at talking to the media and you don't have time to pontificate about concepts. You have to speak in sound bites so that they can take those sound bites and craft them into a story. So it's just the only way I know how to deliver content. Well, you do it startlingly well. Um, I really appreciate you. Let's give another shout out for people that are kind of driving and can't write this down. Best way for people to follow you is? Cameron Herald and it's H-E-R-O-L-D.com. And then again, all of my books, Amazon, Audible, and iTunes, and check out the Second in Command podcast, and it's on YouTube. All right, perfect. I'll put those links in. Cameron, thank you very much for sharing your time with you. Love your load, pal, and see you soon. Appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Well, that was another episode of the Art of Making Things Happen podcast with me, your host, Steve Sims. If you like it, you know the scoop. Subscribe, tell your friends, share it around. Let them get benefit from this juice. And, of course, if you want to change the room you're in, Join Sims Distillery. Jump over to stevedsims.com forward slash Sims Distillery, or you can find a link directly from that website. That's the room where creative disruptors get together to actually help each other become better. If you've got standards or you want higher standards, join the right room. See you next time.